somewhere out here in the immeasurable universe is the planet Earth. You find it first from this vantage point by identifying our galaxy, that graceful pinwheel-like form of countless stars. This is the Milky Way, and all but hidden in its vastness is an apparently insignificant yellow pinpoint, the sun. Ninety-three million miles from the sun, but nonetheless locked in its gravitational embrace, is Earth, one of the smaller of the nine major planets orbiting the sun. Earth is the only inhabited planet in the solar system, possibly in the galaxy, perhaps in the universe. A delicate life-sustaining balance exists between the sun and Earth. And when there are perturbations on the sun, the impact often is felt on Earth. Space Environment Services Center, I'd like to advise you that we have a K index of five. We expect intermittent storm conditions for the next 24 hours. Flaring on the sun. The gaseous ball is erupting, spewing particles of energy out into space at enormous velocities. In less than 10 minutes, X-rays from the flare will enter the Earth's environment. Soon will follow high and low energy protons, and then, two to four days later, additional protons and a magnetic field are carried across space by the ever-blowing solar wind. The most visible evidence of solar flaring is the aurora borealis, the northern lights. Streamers of white, green, or red paint the sky to the north as electrons accelerated in Earth's disturbed magnetosphere plow into the upper atmosphere, colliding with nitrogen and oxygen molecules and atoms there. Most prominent in the Arctic, northern lights have been viewed from as far south as Mexico City. While certainly the most dramatic of the effects of solar flaring, the aurora is among the least disruptive. Other more significant consequences of solar disturbances are explained by Gary Heckman, chief of the Space Environment Services Center, a solar monitoring and forecasting facility operated jointly by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the U.S. Air Force in Boulder, Colorado. We monitor the x-rays that can cause fade-outs on shortwave communications. The Department of Defense, the Federal Aviation Administration, and international broadcasters such as the Voice of America use our forecast and alerts to keep their systems operating without interruption during times of high flare activity. The protons from solar flares can be a radiation hazard for astronauts on certain shuttle missions. We work with NASA during these missions to provide them with forecasts and analyses of radiation conditions in space so that they can provide the proper protection for the astronauts. The large storms that occur two to four days after large solar flares cause operating hazards for satellites. During large March activity this year, some of the U.S. navigation satellites were out of position by up to 10 miles because of the heating of the atmosphere due to the geomagnetic storm. Power companies use our forecasts and alerts to keep their systems operating during geomagnetic storms when power distribution is threatened. Solar data collected at the Space Environment Services Center routinely is passed along to NOAA's National Geophysical Data Center for archiving, analysis, and dissemination to solar researchers and others. The need for the most accurate, most timely forecasts possible of solar events is obvious. Earlier notification of impending disturbances on the sun enable those whose activities are impacted to take more effective, cost-saving, preventive steps. And this requires an improved understanding of solar dynamics, the focus of some of the research conducted by NOAA's Space Environment Laboratory, headed by Dr. Ernest Hildner. The Boulder K Index at 8. Solar activity arises from the sun's magnetic field. The sun's magnetic field, in turn, comes from the internal flows of material inside the sun which generate that magnetic field. The magnetic field bubbles from the solar interior up to the surface 
and evinces itself most obviously in small dark spots that we call sunspots. Solar flares are a sudden change or translation of energy from the magnetic field into other forms of energy. Particles are accelerated, there is a great deal of heat released, and there is an ejection of material from the sun. These are in varying proportion depending upon the flare. Some flares may have more of one type of energy and less of another. If there are many energetic particles and they are easily released from the sun, then shortly after the flare begins, these particles will arrive at Earth and could create a hazard to humans in space. They are a hazard to electronics, computers, and things that are orbiting in the satellites that are already in space. Flares convert magnetic energy into three other forms of energy. They heat up the solar atmosphere, they speed up, they accelerate particles to almost the speed of light, and they throw off great chunks of solar material. The effects of these flares on Earth can be either nothing or very profound. Every day we observe the solar activity and the geomagnetic activity. Some days it's exciting, some days it's not very exciting. But each day we add one more increment to our long-term database. The existence of such a long-term database is extremely important because it provides us with a basis of comparison between today's activity and the history, historical activity. It provides us with a database on which we can do research to try to understand the basic processes that create the solar and geomagnetic activity. And it enables us to understand the climatology. That is, we can make plans based on the average behavior of the sun and of the earth. The first link in the chain of events is the appearance of sunspots on the solar disk. But not all sunspots cause solar flaring. Which ones will? Which cluster of spots demands closest monitoring? NOAA researcher Patrick McIntosh answered these questions in pioneering studies of sunspot shapes. He developed a system of classifying sunspots by shape. Today, the worldwide standard for identifying those sunspots most likely to cause solar flaring. The sunspots come in a variety of forms. We know now that certain shaped sunspots are much more active in producing flares than others. Even today we have on the sun a variety of sunspot groups. There are at least a dozen, one of which has the shape that I would expect to give large solar flares. It is more filled in in the middle. It is more rounded, whereas the, the simple inactive sunspots are stretched out and have a lot of space between the sunspots. So we have made a classification that allows us to divide the sunspots into 60 different top kinds. And a small number of those 60 have been correlated with the powerful solar flares. Once flaring begins, it is quickly determined by the use of radio telescopes, which measure the changes in the radio energy output of the sun, even on cloudy days when optical telescopes are impractical. And special space environment monitors, routinely carried on NOAA weather satellites, measure solar radiation as it begins to flow off the surface of the sun. Dr. Ronald Zwickel of NOAA discusses monitoring of solar events. Currently, our instrumentation, both ground-based and satellite-based, leaves us very blind from the surface of the sun over here until we get very near the Earth over here, until we actually impact the Earth. If we now start looking at our solar terrestrial environment, and that's that environment from the sun over to Earth, we find that at the sun, the sun has a region uh, near the surface which has a lot of activity in this activity, you often see very near the surface by looking at x-rays near the surface. Here you can see it best with some kind of an instrument like a solar x-ray imager. As you get further out, you often see material that comes out in loop-like structures. These loop-like structures are called coronal mass ejections. This information can often be seen as it comes out in this interplanetary medium 
by looking at ground-based instruments called interplanetary scintillation, we define that as IPS, by looking at a star and the light that passes through this material will scintillate. Much like on a hot day in the summer, if you look down very close to the edge of the road, you'll see these little mirages and you'll see the heat waves will make things move. It's exactly the same thing. And so from that, you can tell that this material is coming and what the material is. As you get further out, all this volume here is filled with solar wind, which is a plasma, which is ionized particles. These are coming out, coming towards the Earth. And now in between the Earth and the Sun, at a very unique place where the gravity is the same, if you were right here at this point, you would just stay there because of the balance of the gravity. You put a satellite right here at this point. It's about one hour upstream of the Earth. So you could sit here and monitor what's actually coming before it gets to the Earth. When it does get to the Earth, this information, this uh, material from the sun, the ionized plasma, is going to cause different perturbations. It often causes a magnetic field to change, to oscillate, to move around, which is called geomagnetic activity. Particles can come in all the way to the surface of the Earth, which is radiation. And those kind of things are what we are interested in here. Now, the best thing that we have is to look towards the future and ask ourselves, how could we improve being blind from here to here, which is about 93 million miles? Currently, we can't see from here to here because we have no instruments that do that for us. But if we were able to have a solar X-ray imager, which we currently have on in the plans now, we could see this material as it starts to bubble up, as it changes on the surface of the sun. The interplanetary scintillation, we are now currently have instrumentation in England, also in India, and maybe in the future in Australia, which will map out this information from the sun and tell us when this material is out in the interplanetary medium and when it might get closer to the Earth. Now, the instrument that we discussed previously, the solar X-ray imager, will have a channel on board to do monitoring of this UV. Now, the UV, when it gets to the Earth, is, has a direct impact on the ozone concentration. So what we see is a direct relationship between solar activity on the sun and the ozone concentration, which is protecting us from this harmful UV radiation. The forecasting of imminent solar disturbances is only part of the picture. Long-range forecasts, outlooks of the intensity of solar disturbances a number of years in the future increasingly are needed. Electric power system designers and satellite operators are among those who need our long-range solar forecast for designing systems that will operate through the level of disturbances we expect in the next five to ten years. Billions of dollars are being invested by governments and private entities in anticipation that the commercial, military, and research satellites of the future will be able to operate effectively throughout their designed lifespan. This solar cycle is tracking the largest solar cycle on record in an uncannily close fashion. We therefore expect that over the next few years, our solar activity and geomagnetic activity will be at near record or even exceeding record levels. A solar cycle lasts approximately 11 years, starting from a low minimum, rising to a maximum in about four years, and then decreasing to the next minimum in the next seven years. During the last solar cycle, Skylab re-entered unexpectedly because the increased solar activity increased atmospheric density and satellite drag. At this maximum of the solar cycle, we have many more satellites up. And just to name some NASA satellites, the Solar Maximum Mission, the Solar Mesosphere Explorer, the Long Duration Exposure Facility, and the Hubble Space Telescope are all affected by this solar maximum and its increased solar activity. At the next solar maximum, we'll have the space station, we'll have the shuttles, perhaps we'll have the National Aerospace Plane. All of these will require long-term forecasting of solar activity and the effects on the terrestrial atmosphere. NOAA's Watch on the Sun, an essential service, assuming increased importance during this time of solar maximum. Around the clock, every day of the year, 
monitoring the Earth's most important star, striving to better comprehend its nature, the role of NOAA's Space Environment Laboratory. <laughs>